Hello, I'm Morris Ardwin. I wrote a book about growing up in a large family that ran a little roadside motel in Louisiana in the 1970s. The book's called Stone Motel, Memoirs of a Cajun Boy. And you can get it through your local independent bookseller through the IndieBound website, which is I-N-D-I-E-B-O-U-N-D dot O-R-G. You can also get it online at barnesandnoble.com or at Amazon as well as directly through the publisher, which is the University Press of Mississippi. Today, I'll be reading from chapter 11. It's called Billy Joe. Billy Joe Oldberg showed up one Saturday night at Snooks, a low ceiling, cavernous Cajun honky-tonk just west of Ville Platte, and the best night out in all of Evangeline Parish. At Snooks, you could order a setup, which included a fifth of Old Charter, six Cokes, and a bucket of ice, though Billy Joe was partial to MD 2020 or a quart of malt liquor. Yet, <clears throat> I could see just by looking at her that she was a good woman, he said, explaining how he and Mama met when she first introduced him to our family that Easter Sunday in her house on East Jackson Street. Seeing how he was to be Mama's stepfather and the step-grandfather to us kids, this meeting was important to everyone most especially Billy Joe. And I can tell you, she was quite the dancer, he continued, quite the dancer. She had no competition amongst those ladies there. He drawled in his sticky Alabama twang, tee hee. Six feet, two inches tall and skinny, with enough stringy graying yellow brown hair left at the sides and back to convincingly cover his otherwise balding head. Billy Joe Olberg looked and sounded like he belonged somewhere, but not here. Mama had at least a decade on him, but his lax posture, the dark semicircles under his eyes, and the red blotches on his face made it hard to believe there was any difference in the age between them. He had arrived in Ville Platte on a Continental Trailways bus two months before from Daphne, Alabama, following a tip from a brother-in-law who had heard about construction jobs in Louisiana. The timing couldn't have been more opportune. He had been warned by more than a few denizens of Daphne that he should think about making a new start someplace else. In Daphne, Billy Joe had amassed a string of complaints against him, fueled most often by his over-familiar relationship with that MD-2020. His rap sheet included urinating in public, vagrancy, rent evasion, disorderly conduct, and default on personal loans. People don't like it if and you stiff him, his brother-in-law Johnny Jack said to him as he boarded the bus. You attract trouble like shit attracts flies, and it don't help that you got that glass eye and that hole in your head. Billy Joe couldn't argue with that. He was fully aware that his two distinct deformities, each acquired from a different mishap that he refused to explain while sober, made people uncomfortable when he pointed them out, something he only did after the MD-2020 loosened his tongue. If he could stay sober, no one would ever be the wiser, and that was a big if. The glass eye looked pretty real, and you'd have to be standing over him or pretty tall to notice the divot in his skull at all. The story was he had lost his eye rolling around in the dirt in a schoolyard fight with Raymond McKinnish, his best friend who had grabbed his head like a bowling ball, plunging his thumb clean through Billy Joe's right eye socket. Not 10 years later, Billy Joe acquired that notch in his head one afternoon, drunk out of his mind, when he tripped and fell headfirst into a set of swinging doors. He suffered a concussion, but pulled through well enough. He'd be plagued by headaches for the next three years, but beyond that, had no other symptoms. At Snooks that Saturday night, Billy Joe met Mama for the first time. He danced with her and only her, even though she urged him to dance with the other ladies. I promised her I'd be up yonder the next Saturday night, and the next after that she's going to be there too, he said, pulling his, putting his arm around Mama as she rolled lemons for the Easter lemonade. And sure enough, she showed up. Mama explained that she had indeed looked forward to their second and subsequent meetings at Snooks. It had been nearly three years since Dejan fell over in the living room floor with a heart attack, his third, and the one that would kill him. There was something still very young about her at 60. 
She was in great physical shape, loved to dance, and had lots of stamina. And she had finally had enough of staying home on weekends. He flatters me, she said. Nobody else is doing that. So I danced with him, me. He was a good dancer. We passed us a good time. She looked happy. That was enough to cast away any doubts that may have danced in our minds about this seemingly odd coupling. In May, after they married at the Ville Platte Courthouse, Mama urged Daddy to help the newlyweds get a start by hiring Billy Joe to help him in the yard and Andy with the carpentry work around the motel. He and Mama would set up house in the apartment 18 and 19. You got any experience putting up siding? Daddy asked Billy Joe on his first day of work. Well, not exactly, but I have done quite a bit of carpentry work, so I reckon I could figure it out pretty quick, said Billy Joe. I got these two buildings, and at the back of that one over there, we got to do, Daddy said, pointing to the laundry, the apartment 21 building, and the back side of apartment 16 and 17 and 18 and 19. That's got to be our first job, Daddy explained. After that, we'll get up there on that roof of 21 and pull up all that old tin and put down some new shangles. You think you can handle that? Oh, yes, sir, said Billy Joe. That shouldn't be too complicated. For the first few weeks, the work progressed smoothly. Turned out Billy Joe was indeed a capable carpenter and took direction eagerly. What was not apparent at first, at least not until about a month into the work, was that he was not as capable of staying sober. Apparently at night, back in the apartment with my map, he had been sneaking more than a few chugs of MD-2020. When he didn't show up for work one morning, Daddy rang their apartment. Hello, my man answered. Hello, Hortense, Daddy said. They spoke briefly in French. He told her he was wondering where Billy Joe was. When she reported that he had a malo vent, stomach ache, last night, but was on his way. Daddy asked her to let him know he should join him and Andy behind the old motel building where they would be working that day. Okay, bien, she said and hung up. Behind the building, Daddy and Andy had already hauled out a pickup load of siding that would go over the old peeling clapboard. It was the last building on the property that would get the faux stone tar-based siding treatment Daddy thought would tie in well with the form stone that had covered the front side of all the old, old buildings and the beige brick of the new one. An hour had passed before Daddy decided to check on Billy Joe again. Again, Mama answered the phone. This time, however, she informed Daddy that Billy Joe couldn't work that day because of his stomach ache. Okay, well... Daddy started to tell her before she interrupted him. Demain, she said, tomorrow. The siding and roofing work continued with or without Billy Joe for a couple more weeks. In that time, there were at least two more occasions where Billy Joe showed himself to be too unreliable to count on for any real help. So Daddy finally had to break the news to Mama that Billy Joe would have to go back to Bill Platt. That's not what I had wanted, Daddy told Mama. Your Mama can stay as long as she likes, but this is just not working out. That man is not paying attention and I have to babysit him more than I have time for. I got too much to do to have to stop to keep and stop and keep up with that kind of thing. Let me tell her, Mama said. She'll understand. My mad did understand. She'd been getting her own education about the fact that Billy Joe had a serious drinking problem and that it didn't look like it would be going away anytime soon. Plus, while she liked to to be near all of us, deep down, she missed her house in Real Platte. Y'all still gonna come visit, okay? She asked Dickie, and uh, as Dickie and I hugged her goodbye. Definitely, I replied, soon as we can. Their time with us at the motel had a little bit of a numbing effect on Dickie and me. Later, when we did spend some time at her house in Ville Platte, the atmosphere there was noticeably changed, but not so much that we felt the need to stay away completely. But with Billy Joe around, we weren't ourselves. We couldn't relax as much couldn't be as unselfconscious as before. He made an effort, but we just couldn't warm up to him. I don't like it when he's there, Dickie said. I wish we could go back to when, the way it was when it was just her. Me too, I told him. But I still love being there with her. Me too, he said. It was a situation my ma clearly recognized, but she didn't know what to do about it. You all miss Papa? She asked me one afternoon on her back porch. When we were alone, I nodded my hand. I know y'all do, 
I miss him too, Misha, she said, looking up into the clouds. This has been a reading from Stone Motel, Memoirs of a Cajun Boy, written by me, Morris Ardwan. You can find more at www.morrisardwan.com. Thanks for listening.